thank you, and I don't feel that I have ever stood before a class with more excitement than I feel in your spirits. And I feel that because of that, God is going to honor it and give us something that we've never had before in our spiritual experiences, that we're in for a great time of spiritual revelation. Uh, these classes, of course, are completely non-denominational. They have no relationship to any denomination on the face of the earth. We wish to just teach you from the Word of God that all children of God can enjoy it together, and we don't have to say that is a denominational doctrine. Uh, I, I believe in all pertinent truth. You have to get away from denominations. Now, now there is truth. Well, maybe half truth. That, that is denominational. You know, you've got to believe this way to belong to the church. But when it comes to the great truths of the universe, they're singular, and they belong to everybody. And so in this class, we wouldn't want anyone. We have Roman Catholics in this class, Lutherans and Presbyterians and Methodists and full gospel people and all kinds of persons. And we believe that truth belongs to all of us. And that when we share truth with one another, that Jesus is pleased when we're one body in Christ. And I feel that unity of spirit in your lives. And I thank God for the honor of ministering to you from the Word of God. May I bless you. Bless these and open their spirits to the truth of God. Open up their whole inner persons to the truth of God. And let this become the most delightful learning experience in their total lives. Now, Lord, we just believe you for this, and we thank you for it. Amen. In our former lessons, we have been giving an introduction to the total man, and especially uh, in his quest, his, 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 his seeking after, his seeking after the, the great truths of God. And uh, we came to the place where Adam rebelled, and something happened. God said, the day that you eat of that tree and the fruit of it, you will die. Now, God is not a liar. Adam ate of that tree. What died? His body did not die. It lived 930 years after that, with sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters and down. His soul didn't die because his mind be remained clear. He could name all the animals on the face of the earth and remember their names and could give a name to every flower on the face of the earth and remember the name of that flower. Pretty sharp, I'd say, wouldn't you? So his mind didn't die. Now, his emotions didn't die because there was great rage in his family. Can you imagine the first family, the first family, and one son killed another son, murdered him. That's at the beginning. That is the start of everything. The first family gave birth to a murderer. When sin hit this world, it hit it full grown. It danced onto the stage of human affairs full grown. No infant. Emotions were very strong. Anger. Emotion. Hate. Emotion. Murder. Emotion. And Cain murdered Abel. And so man's emotional being didn't die. His willpower didn't die. Men will to do as they please. And that's what brought the flood. <laughs> Men willed to not serve God. And that's what brought the flood. And so man did not die in his soul parts. Then what died? His spirit man died. His relationship with God died. Immediately, when he transgressed, he hid from God. He went and hid himself. Every sinner hides from God. That's something. Before I got saved, if there was any manifestation of God, in the, man, I love dead services because I wasn't scared. But any time God came alive in a service, I usually went right out that back door. Why? I was afraid of God, you see. Sin is afraid of God. So what happened to them? Number one, you've read it. 
As soon as Eve sinned, she said, whoo, I'm naked. Well, what was she just before that? You want to read it in the Bible? In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, it says, It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, and the fifth day of the month, I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me. Then I beheld in low a likeness as the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire from the loins, even upward, as the appearance and the brightness, as the color of amber. Verse 4 says, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the Spirit. The Bible says God is a fire. The Bible also says he made Adam in his image and his likeness. Now you'll notice in Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mount of God to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, but the bush was not consumed. There is a fire that does not hurt. There is a fire that does not consume, and God is that fire. Now, if God made Adam and Eve in his own image, they couldn't see their nakedness. They were clothed with a dazzling, brilliant, glorious light. Looked like fire. But the moment that she sinned, she said, whoops, I'm naked. And she was ashamed. She began to look for fig leaves to put them together. Fairly poor seamstress. Especially when you start trying to make britches out of fig leaves. That's more difficult, you know. Because as soon as Adam ate of the fruit, he lost his majesty. Whew. I'm naked. So they lost the clothing God had clothed them in, you see. And then they lost his presence. And they lost what you call that born-again nature, relationship with God. Their conscience became a second-rate thing that you could mess around and play with and disobey it. Beforehand, it had, it, 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 it had flowed so magnificently with God, so beautifully with God. And so what died? The third person of the triune being inside of the man died. The spiritual person died. Their relationship with God died. And when God thrust them out into the world, he was operating on two cylinders and not three. He was operating on soul and body. Adam's nature changed into a soulical being from a spiritual being through transgression. That's the reason Jesus is called the second Adam. He brings you back to that very place where man lost his glory and he clothes you again with glory, with the glory of salvation, with the glory of God's righteousness, with the glory of God's purity, with the glory of God's peace, with the glory of God's joy, and you become a glorious one <laughs> because you have gotten back and returned to the place where the third part of your being comes alive in God and you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. And then when you come to that place, your next business is to learn how to function there. You say, well, won't you automatically function there? No, you won't automatically function there. You will automatically function where you want to function. If you want to function in your solical parts, you can do it. I don't want to disturb you too much, but uh, when you get to heaven, you won't have to obey God if you don't want to. Oh, you said, now, now. Well, if you have to obey him, you're a prisoner. And, 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 if, you, and if you don't have any mind of your own, you're a zombie. Now, I don't know that anybody will ever leave heaven, but you don't have to stay. You say, why? Well, that's what love is. You know, when a man and a woman really love one another, when they know they don't have to live together. You with me? Anytime you think she's your prisoner, you're about to lose her, she's got a key called divorce. And she can get out of there. 
People live with us because they want to. And God lives with us because you want him to. And if you don't want God to live with you, he, don't, he won't live with you. That makes it mighty nice. We're going to heaven because we want to. We don't have to go. How many glad you want to go? Yeah. And when we get there, we're going to want to stay. That's exciting too. But even in heaven, you can say, I don't have to stay here if I don't want to. Bless God, the gates are open. I can take off through the constellations if I want to. But I don't want to. And that's going to make heaven heaven. That's going to make heaven heaven. So Moses discovered that there was a fire that wouldn't consume anything. It was the same fire that Ezekiel saw when he said, from his loins upward was fire, from his loins downs was a fire. Such was the similitude of the God of Israel. And at the time that he lost his relationship with God, he lost his garments. And then he lost his communion with God. Isn't that a terrible thing? He lost his communion with God. He walked out of Eden bankrupt, devastated, losers. Sin is the biggest losing game in the universe, and people don't seem to be able to catch on to it. Every problem in this world today is directly related to transgression and rebellion against God. Is that right or not? Directly related to it. And all the good things in this world are directly related to serving God. That's the positive side. And so now Adam and Eve, our forebearers, had two parts. And that's all you were born with. When you are born on this earth, you were born two parts. You are not born with three. You have to be born again. When Jesus told Nicodemus that, Nicodemus was just about like some of your neighbors. He couldn't believe it. Here was an old man, 90 years old, a member of the Supreme Court in Israel, a man that had kept the commandments of God, and a man that loved the young preacher called Jesus, and went out to drink more of that fountain, got out there and says, Rabbi, we know you came from heaven. Jesus didn't even answer him. He said, you got to be born again. John chapter 3. And he says, <laughs> Now, you know, young rabbi, it says, uh, my mother's been dead quite a few years, and I'm about 90. What was it you just said about just getting born again? Jesus said there is a birth of the natural flesh, and there's a birth of the Spirit. You've got to be born again, man. You say, did he get it? He, yeah, he got it that night. You read the New Testament. He acted like it ever after that. He had a divine relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God can bring to birth the third part of a human being that's dead. Ephesians chapter 2 says, You that were dead in sins and trespasses hath he revived. Dead. And so in Adam, we have the death of the human spirit. And we crippled our walk out the garden door of Eden into the devastated world of briars and thorns working on two things, a soulish, Adamic mind, emotions, and will, and five senses that in their natural state will not serve God and don't want to serve God and have to be commanded of the Spirit to serve God before they will. And that is a situation that every one of us are born to. Whether we like it or don't like it has no relationship to the problem whatsoever. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 45, It is written, The first man, Adam, was a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. So you're two persons. You have within you the first man, Adam. His blood is in our veins. The first man, Adam. But we also have within us as Christians a last man, Adam, which is a quickening spirit. Each of your two portions of you have a throne. Your soul has a throne. The throne of your soul is your mind. Now, 
when, I, when, I, when a person comes to me and wants to be delivered from demon power, invariably I have to relieve that power from his mind. You say, why? That's the throne. And the devil always looks for a throne. <laughs> from the very beginning up in heaven, it was a throne he was after. And even when he has an antichrist, you watch him, he'll get a big throne to set him on because he'll be right in the middle of him. He, he, he's so throne conscious. When he's in hell forever, he'll be sitting on somebody down there. He, he, he is so after a throne. And Jesus was so different from that. He was a servant. But your throne of your soul parts is your mind. Hundreds of people that I prayed for said it felt like they had bands around their head. I haven't heard anything like that. Bands. Are, and, and they would tighten. Tighten. You see? The devil wants to control the throne. So when you set a person through, free, then you set their mind free first. You want to know something real interesting? And in our next semester, we'll be teaching on, on this. And, and that is... And that is the, the power of God to, to flow through you to set people free. It'll be our, our, our deliverance class. Every person here that has the Spirit of God in you and you've come alive in your spirit can set anybody free in their soulful parts if you want to. All the specialized business is the concept of man's brain. You say, can you prove that? In the Great Commission, Jesus said it. Jesus says, he that believeth can cast out devils. He didn't say preacher. He didn't say, he didn't say deacon. He didn't say elder. He said, if you believe, you can do it. And so that means you. If you can believe, you can do it. But when you come against the powers, the powers that be, you're going to find him on a throne. Now, the throne of the natural man, the Adamic nature, is in his mind. So you have to set him free there. But man has another throne, and that is the throne of his spirit. And this is the one I've searched for for so many years. Where is the throne of his spirit? It's in his belly. Now, we can read the Bible so many times and not find it out. It's amazing. It was Jesus that said it. Jesus says that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He did not say out of your head nor your heart. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Now, God has chosen that in this little part of your being right here to establish a throne there. And all happiness flows out of there. Ha, ha, ha. You can't laugh any other way. It comes from the spirit part of you. You can say, he, he, he. But that's from Hollywood. And that's, that's tinsel. And that's not for real. When you're really happy, you are ha, ha, ha. Did you know that when you receive a spiritual language from heaven, it flows out of your spirit? No one has ever spoken a spiritual language to the heavenly Father with their, with their prayer language out of any other place but their spirit. Did you know when God gives you gifts of the Holy Spirit, that those gifts of the Holy Spirit flow out of this area and not this area? The nine gifts of the Spirit all flow from your spirit area. All of the fruit of the Spirit, there are nine of them. All of the fruit of the Spirit flow from this area right in here. They do not flow from this area. This is an area you have to keep under divine subjection. You can never do it excepting through your born-again nature. <laughs> that new man in you has to become boss, almost a tyrant. And he has to have full control. Or otherwise, there'll be a wild man running around on the inside of you. But when he becomes a total master, and in our lessons, we're going to say king, the king within you. And then the rest of you becomes a servant to the king. Then you are the spiritual entity just like Jesus. <laughs> just like Jesus. 
You'll be a spiritual entity. Then, then you will be living by a new man, by a new power, by a new spirit. It will be your spiritual elements that will be surging up within you. You will start thinking, and it will not be from here. It'll be from here. Isn't that something? And your emotions will not, will not flare up and, and, and run away with you and grouch you and, and hurt and all this. It'll flow from here, just like Jesus. And these are the places we're going to teach you how to live by your spirit man and how to cause your Adamic man, the man of Adam, the fallen man, to be subject. Don't kill him. Make a servant out of him. As I told the, the people in, a, in, a, in another class, that, that there are those today uh, who, who bury their wounded. And, and, and that grieves me deeper than I can ever tell you. You're not supposed to bury wounded. You're supposed to heal wounded. And if the church would stop burying its wounded and start healing its wounded, God would be pleased with us. And in the spirit man that we're going to teach about, we're going to teach you how to heal the wounded and not bury them. Sometimes if a person falls or a person does something that's wrong, rather than helping them back up, man, we get our shovel out. Brother, we just start <laughs> covering him up. God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to forgive him. God wants us to love him. God wants us to help him. Now, that's your spirit man acting. It's going to be just as necessary to teach you the functioning of the spirit man within you as it is to make the definitions. Did you know that millions of Christians have no idea when they're living in the spirit and not living in the spirit? Did you know that every church problem there ever was was in the soulish part of the church, the Adamic nature, and was not in Jesus? There's never been a church problem excepting it was in Adam and not in Jesus. I don't care how proud you were to split that church. Church problems come from the solical part of the human being. That's the reason why we have to have this class. That's the reason we have to learn what is spirit and how to live in that spirit, how to function, how to think in that spirit, that we would have what we call the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ was a spiritual mind, was not a carnal mind, was not a natural mind. And you, as a Christian, can still live with a carnal mind if you desire to. That's when your rewards in heaven are low. And that's when you don't get to rule over ten cities. You have to come down to one because you have lived carnally and naturally and adamically and not in your Jesus nature and in your born-again spirit nature. And if we haven't lived there, uh, then, then we can't be great in the kingdom of God. If you know that, say amen. amen. It is an amazing thing to me that our modern man can develop science and can split an atom. And yet, modern man in all of his universities, not one of them can divide the soul from the spirit that we're doing here right now. Man has developed a vehicle in which he can fly to the moon and get back safely. Yet he cannot comprehend the complexity of his own mind nor can he control his own emotions, nor can he direct his own willpower. That's the reason your penitentiaries are full. That's the reason your insane asylums are full. That's the reason many people die prematurely. When we lived in the Philippines, in the Philippine Islands, in Manila, one of their number one movie idols and stars was converted. Carlos Padilla was one of their great ones. He had had a stroke. His tongue hung out the side of his mouth. And he was almost like an idiot, I suppose. They brought him to our services. And Brother Clifton Erickson was the evangelist. And God healed that man. I mean, he didn't halfway heal him. He healed that man. That man got right up and began to talk. His tongue went back into his mouth. They brought him in in a, in, a, in a wheelchair, and he walked out of there with somebody else rolling the thing by himself. God healed him. I went over to his house to see him. His wife was a very beautiful woman. She might have been a movie star, too. 
she says to me, says, Brother Sumrall, this man gets this way. He says, this is not the first time he's had this. He gets this way through his temper. He says, I've seen him scream until he foams at the mouth and falls on the floor. And I turned to Carlos and I said, that's your natural Adamic nature. If you ever do it again, you may die. He said, I promise not to. I promise not to. He was dead in one month's time. His wife said, Brother Sumrall, he got so angry. He got so angry. He screamed. They could hear him a city block. And the moment that he dropped dead, he was bellowing like a bull and cursing as loud as he could curse. If you don't get control of that Adamic nature and subdue it by the power of the Spirit, it'll ruin you and send you to the wrong place. But we're in this class to learn and to know and to be sure and to live the Jesus life. And all the people said, Amen. and bless them as they learn, O Lord, touch their spirits gently and sweetly and let their souls fall in line with their spirits and live for God and their bodies, servants of the Most High. We thank you for it. Amen.